Okay, um, this is about a transistor uh, PA design from start to finish. And this, this assumes that you understand a little bit about transistors, uh, basic concepts, and obviously things like Ohm's Law, basic electronics concepts. But um, this will show you how to build a transistor power amplifier the entire design process. So first of all, we have to choose a topology. Now, first of all, I should probably say we're going to do this with uh, class A or, or I mean class B or class AB push pull devices. So not single ended. Um, we're going for you know usable efficiency here. So these emitter followers that you see in each case, those are push pull emitter followers, and the topology depends, because those will be the same in either case, but how we drive them matters uh, differently. In drawing C, uh, that's a differential input, and that's what you normally see in stuff like op amps, because you can cancel noise, common mode, and you can reduce distortion quite a bit. And uh, we are going to be using uh, uh, configuration A. It uses shunt feedback, and it's a lot simpler than the other two, because the input stage is the voltage amplification stage. So it greatly simplifies the design and the fidelity is still reasonably good. So the overall look is going to look kind of like something like this, where you've got your voltage amplifier TR6 giving you the gain necessary uh, to bring the input level up to what's needed to drive the output stage, the drivers and the output stage. And then you have a bias network in the collector circuit of TR6 to bias the output stage into conduction. So before all, we, we, we get to the details, we have to know the specs of this amp. So namely, how much output power, input sensitivity, and input impedance do we want? So to keep this kind of simple, we're gonna do just say 10 watts, into a four ohm speaker load. Now you can go higher in ohmage, make it like an eight or 16 ohm. However, you're going to need a higher power supply voltage uh, to get the same power. So to keep the power supply voltage reasonably low, we're gonna use a four ohm speaker and we want half volt RMS input for full output. And we want the input impedance to be greater than one kilo ohm. Now, I'm also going to try and use uh, single single supplies for this amp, not uh, split supplies. Uh, if you have split supplies, you can eliminate a lot of capacitors and it, it's a little trickier to design. So I'm just gonna go with a single supply first so you can clearly see what's going on. So then you can make the switch to split supplies in a, in a later design. So uh, we have to figure out the power supply voltage for in current requirements. So the output power we want is 10 watts of the amplifier it's given by that formula. And so if we put in four ohms and 10 watts, you solve for what the VCC should be, and that's gonna be 18 volts. Now, due to the VBE drops, the 0.7 volt drops through each resist, uh, transistor junction of the driver and output resistors, and the their respective emitter resistors, RE1 and RE2, um, there's voltage drops in there too, so you get the the voltage that those transistors actually see is a lot less than 18 volts. So you want to bump it up probably five, seven volts or so, just to be safe. Um, 25 volts was found to be a good number, and you'll verify that later in design. And basically, you want the voltage you want you want it to have it. You want to keep rechecking it uh, to make sure you have enough headroom and to make sure you're gonna get sufficient power into the load. Although sometimes you will design the power supply around what voltages are available, in which case it's a little bit trickier. The output stage has to be able to handle the peak voltage and the peak current that's gonna be delivered to the load. So the peak current is with a 25 volt supply, 3.125 amps, but if you remember all those voltage drops in there, those transistors actually see 18-ish, so 2.25 amps is a, probably closer to reality. Um, and a 
TIP31 and TIP32 TO220 package transistors will meet those ratings and because they have, they have a maximum uh, collector current of around three amps. And in this case, the dissipation will be around two watts. Now, uh, a two to 20 package device can safely dissipate about a little less than a watt of uh, heat without a heat sink just by itself. So if you put a little clip on heat sink on, uh, that will be perfectly fine. That'll, that'll, do, that'll dissipate all the heat that's needed. So the driver stage, if you remember, comes right before, it's TR3 and TR4. Um, they directly drive uh, the output stage. They need to be able to pass enough current, supply enough base current to the output stage. So you have to figure out what is the base current of the output stage. So if the peak emitter current is gonna be 2.25 amps, the minimum beta or the minimum current gain for the TIP31 and 32 is around 25. If you check the data sheet, you can verify this. Um, you wanna be kind of conservative with that. You wanna go with the minimum because you do not wanna run out of base current. If you do, you'll cause premature distortion, premature clipping. So a two and three 904, three 906 pair, uh, both have minimum beta of around 100. So the peak current drive to drive them would then for, therefore be uh, 0.9 milliamps. Um, so the collector current of the stage preceding that, the voltage amplifier must be much greater than 0.9 milliamps. Um, in, in this case, you'll find it'll be three to five milliamps will, will suffice. We'll get there in a moment. Uh, so the output stage emitter resistors are there specifically to uh, stabilize uh, the bias um, so that one doesn't current hog the other and heat up more than the other. So you want it to be less than the load, which is four ohms, but you don't want it to be too low so that you don't want to squander your bias stability. Uh, so 0.47 ohms is a pretty good number for an amp of this power dealing with this kind of current. And the rule of 10 is basically you want it to be 10 times less than what your load is so that you get only 10%-ish of the voltage drop uh, as if it were like equal or something. Um, kind of just a good rule of thumb. So RE3 and RE4, which are the driver resistor uh, emitter resistors, will pass around five milliamps each when the drivers are biased slightly on. And that's gonna be on top of whatever the output stage draws. So how are we gonna bias the output stage into conduction? Well, uh, a pretty clever way to do that is uh, with an amplified diode. Now you can just take a couple of junction diodes and put them in series and you'll get you know, enough voltage drop, but it's not very exact and then you know, you'll, you'll get crossover distortion. So this is a much better way because you can, as you can see, you'll, you'll be able to trim it out and get it to be more exact. But essentially what this is, is a VBE multiplier. That's the other name for, for this, uh, probably more well-known name for this circuit. It basically multiplies VBE, the base emitter junction voltage, uh, based on a resistive divider. Now, and you can vary that resistive divider to get basically whatever voltage you want in the ones of volts range. However, the slope resistance uh, might become significant, especially if you're dropping quite a bit of voltage. So you wanna be careful that uh, that slope resistance isn't too high or it will need to be bypassed. Otherwise it will reduce the gain of your, uh, and increase the distortion actually in your voltage gain stage. So. We'll get to that in a moment. So the way you make it adjustable is you simply uh, put a potentiometer on the base uh, in figure B right there on the left. And on the right, that is the amplified diode being implemented and bypassed with a capacitor. So to figure out the resistor values of our amplified diode, we need to know exactly all the currents and all the voltages we're dealing with. So if we operate the output stage at like 20 milliamps or so to reduce crossover distortion, that puts around 10 millivolts on the 0.47 ohm resistors. And that's negligible compared to 
two times VBE, which is 1.4 volts. So the amplified diode needs to bias both sets of drivers and output stage transistors into conduction. So you need around 2.8 volts um, <clears throat> or four times VBE range. It needs to be adjustable around that. So if you make um, the potentiometer 1K, R1 1K and R2 3K, and R1 and R2 is that, you'll get a range from like 2.65 to 4.3 times 0.7 volts, which is more than good enough. So now uh, the voltage amplifier, which is what's going to be uh, basically driving this whole thing, uh, we need to design this thing so that we get maximum headroom given our power supply. So uh, VC6 is the collector voltage of, of TR6. So VC6 should be around 14 volts or so to allow for voltage drop across its emitter resistor, RE6. So, um, and it's plus uh, the VBE of TR1 and TR3 is gonna be two times 0.7 again. So that voltage really should be like 15.4. And so to bias them into conduction, so the voltage across R3 and R4, now actually, or just R3, you'll see we, we actually split the collector load for reasons I'll get to later, but for now it can be dealt with as one resistor. We wanna know the voltage drop across that network. So, and basically we worked it out, if we want a three milliamp uh, collector current, which is, a good collector current amount. 3.3 uh, kilo ohms will give us the right voltage drop at that current. So if we split the collector load such that R3 is 1.8K and R4 is 1.5K, um, I'll show you the, the schematic with that in a moment. It'll give you 3.3K altogether. Now the slope resistance of the amplified diode, which I spoke about earlier, is only 67 ohms at three milliamps. And it varying, it varies depending on the current. So um, that will add distortion if it's big enough. But in this case, compared to 3.3K, it's pretty small. So it's not really necessary to bypass it with a cap. It won't really do very much in, in, in ways of reducing distortion or anything. Plus, if you were to add a capacitor, it would have to be a very large capacitor because to pass all frequencies of interest at 67 ohms, that cap would have to be huge. So for stable biasing, you need around a few volts to be dropped on the emitter resistor RE6. Um, the problem is the higher that voltage is, it, re it reduces headroom. But since there's a feedback loop, uh, some of that distortion will be canceled. So the, the lower that voltage is, the more distortion there is because it's less stable. But we have a feedback loop, so we can afford to have it to be a little lower. It, it's kind of your discretion. You could probably make it higher if you want. But in this case, uh, half a volt was chosen. So the emitter resistor is only 180 ohms and the bypass cap that goes with that is around 100 microfarad to give a 190 hertz uh, open loop negative 3 dB roll off, which will go lower uh, when you close that feedback loop because the feedback will drop that frequency and so you actually get better frequency response, but we'll get to that. So the base circuitry, so we just did the collector circuit, what the amplified diode's doing and all that. The base circuit of this is basically this voltage divider here. However, we're going to be adding negative feedback in. so that voltage divider upper part anyway is not gonna be tied to VCC. It's gonna be tied to the output, which is about half VCC. So we gotta figure out what base voltage we need on VB, on, on, on this transistor right here, TR6. So we need it to be 1.24 volts because 0.7 volts voltage drop the base will always sit 0.7 volts higher than the emitter. And the emitter is sitting at half a volt, so 
plus 0.54, you get 1.24 volts. And we're running at a current of three milliamps. So the base current then will be maximum 30 microamps require, required because 100 is, if you remember 100 is the beta, the minimum beta of a 2N3904 transistor. So we're just going with minimum here. We're doing worst case predictions here. So if R5, which is the upper leg of that voltage divider is 100K, it's just an even value to start with, you'll get uh, 127 microamps running through that, which is well over high enough. And um, the voltage or the current through that, uh, basically you want the current through the voltage divider leg to be high enough. Now you want 1.24 volts over the lower leg of the potential divider and your base current is 30 microamps and your upper leg of resistive divider is 127 microamps, you subtract those two because the base is going to steal 30 microamps, you'll get about 90-ish out there. So you want the nearest standard value for the lower leg of that potential divider is probably around 15K. So, oh, and the voltage at the top of um, R5 is going to be 14 volts. The output is going to set at around 14 volts. So it's not quite VCC, it's about half that, but it's a little higher because that's what the voltage of the collector of the of TR6 is set at. So now negative feedback that we're, we're so bent on adding is really going to help us out. It's going to reduce distortion and it's going to improve frequency response, low and high. And it's actually going to reduce uh, output resistance too. So this 0.47 ohm resistors we added are going to uh, affect the output even less than they did before. And it's going to provide a DC uh, bias stabilization uh, for the input stage. So it's going to just help so much. However, this is a really weird amp. It's going to have positive and negative feedback at the same time. Capacitor C4 and the split collector load are, gonna, are going to constitute a what's called a bootstrapped uh, collector resistor. I'll get to that very soon. But essentially what that does is it's going to boost the gain tremendously of TR6, adding more loop gain to the feedback loop, increasing its effectiveness. You'll see in a moment. So the feedback, again, that we're using in this type of amplifier is called shunt feedback. If you've ever dealt with op amps before, you'll know that there's two types of feedback. There's series and there's shunt feedback. In this case, we're using shunt because R A is uh, R7 and R B is R5. Those are your two feedback resistors that are gonna dictate the amount of gain this amp makes, which is really gonna help us out in getting our input sensitivity correct. So, Anyway, uh, bootstrapping is basically where you have a split collector load. It can be split in half. It doesn't always have to be, but it's just easiest to split it in half. You get best results that way. Basically what you do is you couple another voltage, AC couple, another voltage around R4 there to get both sides around that resistor to be in phase. Therefore, that resistor looks much larger than it actually is. I have a whole video on this. You can go watch that on, if you want. Just check out my channel. But what it does in this case, in this particular amplifier, is it raises the gain from around 350 with a fair amount of distortion to around 1,000 with about the same amount of distortion. Because the distortion actually, if anything, bootstrapping helps to reduce distortion ever so slightly. It doesn't really make it that much worse. The distortion comes in from having uh, RE6 bypassed. That it, it gives a high gain, but yeah, it's, it's distortion. But again, the feedback loop is gonna uh, reduce a lot of that. And this is the final schematic with all the values filled in. So we made R7 4.7K uh, to set our gain. I'll show you how I did that in the next slides. Right before the speaker, we have 
the output. We have an output coupling cap, of course, to keep DC off of the speaker. In a split supply amp, you won't need that. That's one of the reasons why people do split supply so much. But the little resistor and 0.1 microfarad cap before that is what is called a Zobel network. Basically, without getting into too much detail, a speaker has a certain resonance, and at that resonance, it will generate a high voltage. It'll high enough voltage that it could damage the output transistors if it exceeds their rating. So you put that in there, and it'll actually sound better with that too, but you don't get this weird resonance going on. Uh, we added a 22 puff cap between uh, on the uh, on TR6 there. I'll get to what that is toward the end. But the input voltage sensitivity is what we're after right now. So basically, we want to figure out what the RMS output voltage is at 10 watts. So with a 4 ohm load at 10 watts, you'll get 6.3 volts RMS across the load. Now, assuming a large open loop gain, and in this case, it's reasonably large enough to assume this formula for uh, shunt feedback, you get a gain of around negative 12.6 because it's inverting. If R7, like we said earlier, is going to be 4.7K, it actually sets the sensitivity to be a little higher than half a volt RMS, but uh, that's kind of good because if you want to put a volume control on here, the volume control is going to attenuate even if it's turned all the way up. So it's going to accommodate that much more nicely. Now, the diagram below is example an example of how negative feedback increases frequency response. The open loop gain has decidedly worse frequency response toward the high end. But with the feedback loop closed, your negative 3 dB point is more toward the high end of the audio band, so there is no noticeable, anyway, uh, attenuation or phase shift of the upper frequencies, or it's minimized at least. Low frequency response is primarily determined by the 1000 mic cap at the output of the amp. The 1000 microfarad cap gives a roll off of around 40 hertz, even with the feedback loop. Now, C3 is the input capacitor, and it's made to be 100 microfarads, and it gives probably a response of way less than 40 hertz. It's like ones of hertz, I think. So by comparison, that response is negligible compared to what the limiting factor of uh, the output cap is. And that output cap can be made much larger, but it's just a matter of cost, really. Um, especially if you're driving an amp that doesn't require infra bass, like if you're driving mid-range speakers with this thing, it, it doesn't matter if you have uh, that kind of bass response or not, because the speaker's not going to reproduce it. However, you do want to be a little careful not to have too much phase shift in the mid-range audio band, but this should be fine. You can play with these capacitor values to suit your application. So stability, the reason we put that 22 puff cap in there between the collector and base of the voltage amplifier is for dominant pole compensation. You can look these terms up and you can get the, the, the full explanation of what these things are. But essentially, pole splitting or pole slugging is the act of deliberately shifting forward one of the high frequency poles uh, in an amp to slug its high frequency response so that it does not oscillate. Now, if you're not careful, this can ruin your, your high frequency response to your amp, but if you don't do this, you might have a high power oscillator instead of an amplifier. So, basically you can think of it like this. The 22 picofarad cap is added to attenuate ultrasonic frequencies that might cause the amp to oscillate because at those frequencies, it phase shifts so that the negative feedback becomes positive feedback. And if you have positive feedback under the right conditions, um, you'll have an oscillator at that frequency. So if that frequency that is at the troublesome phase shift is below, if the gain is below one at that frequency, you won't get an oscillation, which is what you want. Now I'm gonna show you this amp in action um, on a breadboard. Okay, this is the amp built up on a, a breadboard here. We've got the output transistors, we got a volume control in front of it, and we got the uh, adjustable uh, 
diode potentiometer there. And there's three giant decoupling caps because I forgot to mention with something of this power, you need some massive decoupling caps. Uh, if you're running a regulated power supply, uh, like that one, operating at 25 volts, um, you need good decoupling caps because otherwise it'll force the regulator to track the signal voltage uh, and it may not sound as good. So right now, I've got it hooked up to the oscilloscope. I'll turn on a signal generator. So we're getting a nice sine wave there. So what you have to do with this amp is you have to adjust uh, the diode to give proper conduction. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna back off the signal down to a pretty low amplitude bring up the uh, uh, amplifier there. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to adjust this diode, the uh, adjustable diode. You see that? Uh, those blips there toward the origin? That's crossover distortion. You want to try and null that out. Once you see, it's just when you see it goes away, that's the optimum location. Any more than that, you'll bias more into class A. Um, any less than that, you'll bias more into class B. Now, the efficiency of this thing is about 75% in class B. Class B is around 75%. Operating at mid to moderate power, its efficiency is around 69-70%. And if you adjust it like that, you'll get uh, it operating in class AB, but barely class AB. So I'm going to run this thing up until it's clipping. Just where it starts to clip. Uh, I'm going to try and measure the voltage. Voltage of that. Can I also do it with a multimeter? Because ultimately you need the RMS voltage of this. You can calculate this. This is uh, uh, be 2 times 10, 20 volt peak to peak, divided by 2 root 2. That will give you 20 divided by 2 root 2. Gives you 7.07 uh, volts RMS. V squared over R, which is 4 ohms, will give you the power. 12.5 watts, which is actually a little higher than we expected. Now, there probably is a bit of distortion in there, uh, probably a couple percent that we can't read. Oh, there's some significant heat coming off these uh, resistors. I literally took four 1 ohm resistors, because I don't have a 4 ohm dummy load. I took four 1 ohm resistors, put them together, and the power supply is drawing, probably bring that up just a bit, but it doesn't really matter. Um, about 620 milliamps. So the efficiency of this thing can be calculated. If it's putting out 12 and a half watts, it's drawing 15, 80% efficient. Um, now, of course, there's some fudge factor in that number. Um, but yeah, if you bias this thing just right, you can get it to be actually quite efficient. Now let's do a square wave test. Not as good as I expected. Uh, let me bump this up. Frequency. Let's see. Okay. I think a lot of that before was just due to... this. These are two... The output capacitor is two 470 ohms in parallel. So it's not quite 1,000. But I don't have a 1,000 microfarad cap that's rated for 25 volts. So I'm using that. Um... Not an awful lot. The rise time is fairly good. I think that's a frequency of 4,500 hertz. Let me back that down to 1 kilohertz. That's a good frequency to start things at. Um, the rise time isn't so bad. I've seen worse, mostly on tube equipment. Basically, what you want to look for is stuff like ringing. You don't see any like oscillation at the top or bottom very much of this. Uh, which is good, because if that were the case, that would mean the feedback loop is unstable. Um, I'm going to back this down to like base frequencies, and you can see, as you can see, the response is absolutely horrible. 
because the capacitors are undersized. Let me bump this up to around 200 hertz. As you can see, it's a lot better. But I think a lot of that's due to um, these two capacitors right here. So yeah, hopefully this video uh, gave you a nice introduction to designing transistor power amplifiers. You can take this exact concept and apply it to uh, much higher power designs as well. It's the exact same concept, even with tube amps. It's a very similar design process you're going to take. Yeah, I hope this helps.